From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Ted Nisi will join me on the second half. From small businesses to big government, the pandemic has had a profound impact on everybody's ledger book. Joining me now live from the State House to talk about the options for small businesses in Rhode Island's bottom line is General Treasurer Seth Magaziner. Treasurer, it's good to speak with you, and I hope everyone in your family is healthy. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me. So, here at Channel 12, Treasurer, we have started an initiative called 12 Respond, so our viewers can write in with questions or problems, and we've been getting thousands of emails, Treasurer. Uh, Treasurer, a lot of people are hurting out there, and I want to bring some of those questions to you, uh, particularly focusing on small businesses in the state. And the first one is from James. He writes us, as a commercial fisherman, restaurants are closed and no one wants to buy my fish. Can I apply for a grant to pay bills and stay in business? Obviously, there are a lot of people in his position. Treasurer, what do you say to James? Yeah, first of all, I just want to begin by saying I am so proud of the way that Rhode Islanders are stepping up in the midst of this crisis. You know, Rhode Islanders have shown that we are tough, that we're compassionate, we look out for our neighbors, uh, despite these very difficult times when a lot of people are getting sick, a lot of people are losing their jobs. Rhode Islanders are really stepping up, and I'm just so proud to be a Rhode Islander now more than ever. Uh, what I would say to James and to all small businesses that are struggling uh, is that there are programs available uh, that may be able to help you. Uh, if you go to the Commerce RI website, commerceri.com, uh, they have a good list of a number of these programs. Some of them are loans, some of them are grants. And um, while I don't know about James's um, uh, uh, specific situation, one piece of good news for him is that many types of independent contractors, self-employed individuals uh, who may not have been eligible for these types of programs in the past are eligible now. For example, the SBA has two loan programs, one called the Payroll Protection Program to make it easier for people to pay their salaries and uh, rent and utilities. There's also an Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program out of the SBA. In the past, many types of businesses like sole proprietorships, self-employed individuals, independent contractors were not eligible for these programs. Now they are. Similarly, uh, unemployment insurance. In the past, frequently, uh, small businesses that fell into some of those categories were not eligible. Today, they are eligible. Uh, so I would direct uh, him and all small businesses who are having a tough time, start at the Commerce RI website. They have a good description of a number of the programs that are available, and many of those programs that were not uh, accessible to independent contractors, self-employed individuals, etc are available to those individuals today. Let's get to a question about timing for people who have tried to take some of those options. We have another question here, and this person writes, I applied for a SBA government loan on March 23rd and a Rhode Island temporary bridge loan on April 3rd. I have not heard back from anyone. And Treasurer, this is obviously a backlog question. What's your understanding of how long these requests are taking? Yeah, there is a backlog and it is a problem and this is something that I've been pushing agencies very hard on, saying we need to be faster, we need to do better. Um, if he applied for uh, an SBA loan on March 23rd, my guess is that that was probably one of those economic injury loans um, that I referenced earlier. Um, that program has actually been enhanced starting March 30th, so we're actually recommending that people who applied for those loans prior to March 30th reapply. Not only might that speed up the process for them, but they actually might be eligible for a better benefit than they were prior to um, uh, the Federal Stimulus CARES Act being passed. Uh, and I talked to the uh, Commerce uh, Office about the bridge loans. Uh, they say that they're typically turning those around in a couple of days. So if, uh, if he applied for those and hasn't heard back, then, then he should reach out to the Commerce Office again. My understanding from them is that that's not the typical experience. Uh, but there's a bigger issue here too, which is uh, unfortunately um, a lot of uh, these small businesses are having a hard time finding lenders that are willing to process their applications. Um, and when you, you say know, lenders, small treasurer, businesses let's, are struggling. Be, let's be clear on this one. When you say lenders, we're talking about banks. This is a, you referenced the payroll protection program. This is part of that stimulus package yeah. that came out $2 trillion. That money comes from the federal government, passes through lenders, uh, and, that, and people have to apply 
to banks, and, and we are hearing that some of these loans are coming with strings attached. You have to open up an account with us. Yeah. You have to have a line of credit. Uh, what are you doing about that? Yeah, that is something that I am very upset about and have been working very hard on over the last week. So uh, to take a step back, uh, we know that small businesses are struggling. Uh, we know people who own small businesses who are having a hard time keeping their people on the payroll are facing the prospect of maybe having to shut down permanently. Uh, there was a piece of good news in the federal stimulus bill, which was this new payroll protection program. And the way it was supposed to work is that small businesses could take out a loan uh, to help them keep their employees on the payroll and also pay for other expenses like utilities and rent and mortgage interest. And the way that they were supposed to be able to get these loans is to go to an SBA lender, which most banks and credit unions in Rhode Island are. and. Uh, the lenders would process those applications and then importantly after two months the loan would be forgiven by the federal government so even though it was a loan really it was the federal government paying for small businesses to so keep it turns their people into a employed grant, in other words. for up to two months exactly now the problem is exactly what you referenced which was that when this program launched last week um, there were some lenders, some banks, and some credit unions that were turning people away, or in some cases were turning people away unless they bought other products, unless they took out a credit card or something like that. That is totally unacceptable. This program is a federal program. It was meant to help small businesses and to help their employees. It was not meant to be a way for banks to try to sell other products. And so as soon as word of that came out, I sent a letter to to every small business lender in Rhode Island, I had follow-up conversations with another of them, with a number of them, and I said, "Cut it out. You know, this is a time when all of us, as Rhode Islanders, need to step up, do the right thing, help our friends and neighbors. This is not, you know, an opportunity to try to sell other products." Well, hold on. And let me so ask you this, uh, Treasurer. Of, let me ask you this uh, to that because I'm sure you're hearing it from them. I mean, banks are, are probably telling you, "Look." we're getting swamped here and we can't keep up with the applications and we need to have some way to limit the incoming. So what do you say to them? What I say to them is that this was meant to be a first come first serve system. And you know, the congressional delegation, others in Congress who designed this program, that's what they say. This was meant to be a first come first serve system. And I understand it's been challenging for the banks to administer. They didn't get guidance from the federal government on how to administer the program until hours before it launched. There were technical issues. But at the end of the day, that is not a reason that we should be allowing lenders to discriminate between small businesses that otherwise are eligible for the program and eligible for this relief. Now the good news is that since we have done this outreach to the lenders over the last week, we've seen some progress. And there are now a number of banks and credit unions in Rhode Island who are telling us that they will process applications for all eligible Rhode Island small businesses regardless of whether they are pre-existing customers or not. So what I would say, if you are a small business in Rhode Island and you are having a hard time finding a bank to process your payroll protection application, contact our office, the Rhode Island Treasury Office, 401-222-2404, and we will point you to those lenders that we have confirmed are taking all eligible applicants. And for those banks that aren't taking all eligible applicants, I'm going to continue to push them to encourage them to do so. All right, Treasurer, we have about five minutes left, so I want to shift gears uh, to another part of, of your job, and, and that is uh, last month legislative leaders approved an emergency plan so the state could borrow up to $300 million to keep government running. As we all know, income taxes were pushed back, so uh, the state is running a little thin right now. How much has the state borrowed so far of that $300 million? Well, these are unprecedented times, and that is why we took unprecedented action to stabilize the state's finances. We have to make sure that um, state government continues to operate so that our public health system, our first responders, our critical agencies have the funding that we need in order to continue to serve people in this very challenging time. So that's why we've taken this unprecedented action. 
Um, we have the authority, as you um, noted, to put these tools into effect to help the state's accounts uh, stay funded through the corona crisis this spring and into the summer. Uh, so far, we've only had to draw about $25 million of that financing that we have the authorization to secure, um, but my expectation is that we will be uh, using more of that authorization uh, quite soon. And where is that money, where's the greatest need in state government for that money right now? Right now, it's all about putting all of our resources toward protecting the health and safety of Rhode Islanders. So, you know, as a state, we are building field hospitals uh, to handle patients and to treat patients in a high quality setting when the traditional hospitals get too full. We are working with law enforcement to promote social distancing and uh, you know to make sure that when people do get sick they're able to get treatment quickly uh, our public health agencies are working around the clock and so this is all about making sure that those agencies have the funding that they need to do their job so that no one has to worry that we're not going to be able to pay the bills uh, that's why we took this unprecedented action and uh, that is what i am committed to ensuring as treasurer state government will continue to be funded and operational throughout the course of this crisis treasurer i i refuse to look at my 401k uh, right now you have to look at the pension fund how's it doing with the markets so so down well, I think if this crisis has shown us anything, it is how important and how vital our public employees are. You know, these are the police and firefighters who are risking their lives every day. These are the, you know, the um, publicly employed nurses and public health officials who are keeping us all safe. Uh, our public employees are vital, and they deserve retirement security just like all Rhode Islanders. My message to the public employees who are watching, who are wondering about the pension system is, don't worry. The pension system is going to be fine. We are not in any way going to take money out of the pension fund to plug budget holes. We're not going to skip contributions into the fund as was done back in the 90s. Um, for me, that is off the table. It is something that I will not support. And this is not going to lead to further re pension reforms in any way, shape, or form. Um, as far as how we're doing, uh, we're holding up better than uh, probably people would expect. Um, we're still waiting for our final March numbers, but I can tell you we knew something like this was going to happen eventually. We were prepared for this. We didn't know it was going to be a virus necessarily, but we knew that there would be at some point a decline in the stock market. And so when we launched our Back to Basics investment strategy back in the spring, I'm sorry, back in uh, 2016, we actually put a big chunk of the pension money into something called the pr crisis protection class basically made up of asset classes that typically go up in a recession when everything else is going down. And while we don't have final numbers yet, uh, I can tell you, year to date through the end of March, the S&P 500 was down 20%. The crisis protection part of our portfolio was up 15%. And the pension fund as a whole, we were down just like everybody was down, but not by as much as people would think. We think it might have been a decline only in the single digits, potentially. And so we're going to weather this storm. We're going to get through it. And to the people in the pension system and to all taxpayers, I would say you don't have to worry. The pension system is doing all right. We're going to get through this. We're not going to take any money out of it. We're not going to have other reforms that result from this. You've got enough to worry about already, staying safe, staying socially distant, protecting your friends and neighbors and your family. You don't need to worry about the pension system. Treasurer, we have 30 seconds here, and I have to ask you, uh, you know, since you're with us right now, when are you going to make a decision on running for governor in 2022? That is the last thing on my mind right now. Our focus is on making sure that we keep Rhode Island safe, that we keep our state agencies funded, that we support our small businesses to help them get through this crisis. And just like everybody else in Rhode Island, I'm focused on looking out for our friends and neighbors in our communities so that we can get through this together. All right. Well, it was worth a shot nonetheless. And I believe we will. General Treasurer <laughs> Seth Magaziner, thank you very much for joining me on the program. When we come back, we go back uh, live to the State House with Ted Nisi for a week in news. Stay with us, you're watching Newsmakers.
Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. We go back live now to the Rhode Island State House, and we're joined by my colleague, politics and business editor, Ted Nisi. Ted, it's good to see you again, and I look forward to the time we can be back in the studio together. It's getting kind of lonely in here. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's very weird for us to be apart this long, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Ted, let's start the same way we did last week, and, and let's take a big picture look at everything. We're taping this, I should note, on a Friday morning. Many of our viewers at home are watching this on a Sunday morning, so a lot will change in the coming days. What, do you, what are your key takeaways uh, from this week? You know, Tim, I keep going back to uh, the governor's office introduced this week a conference call with reporters right after the TV briefing where we can ask follow-ups directly of the governor because we're not in the room due to social distancing. And I asked her yesterday, you know, there's some signs maybe New York is flattening the curve. Does she see that in Rhode Island yet? And she just told me no. The short answer was no. Uh, she, she pointed to the fact that hospitalizations for COVID-19 in Rhode Island are still doubling in a little less than a week. We were at 160 on Thursday. and We're waiting as we tape this for today's numbers to come out. So I think as long as the governor doesn't see the pace of increase in hospitalization slowing down, uh, she's going to remain very alarmed, or maybe alarm's the wrong word, but um, very wary of, of sort of taking her foot off the gas and all the measures to hold back COVID-19. And as we talked about last week, Tim, I think it's important for people, I, I really would say focus more at this point on the hospitalization numbers for Rhode Island, the death numbers for Rhode Island, as well as Massachusetts, because the test numbers, uh, the number of people, the number of cases now is as much a product of more tests as it is more people getting the disease. So I'm really keeping an eye on the hospital number. And a lot of that testing, Ted, uh, which was a big development this week, comes from that CBS testing site at Twin River where they're doing those rapid re uh, result tests. People can go to the CBS website. Rhode Island is just one of, well, at last check anyway, again, we're taping this on a Friday morning, they may have expanded it. Uh, Rhode Island is one of only three states in the country that have this program, and it has really helped uh, the governor reach and surpass her mark of doing at least a thousand tests a day. They've, they've pretty much almost doubled that. Yeah, they, uh, you know, there's, there's capacity and then there's what, the, what they're actually doing. But when CVS is fully online doing what they think they're capable of in Lincoln, that site was going to be doubling the state's daily capacity. So it was over 2,000. I mean, you know, people wonder sometimes, how, why does it matter if a large company is based in one state or another? This is a good example. I don't think if CVS was based in Minnesota, where the Minute Clinic used to be based before CVS bought it, I don't think Rhode Island gets first go, right? Uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts had to go second to Rhode Island on this. So, uh, you know, CVS, it's a big company. They have their, their good and bad. But on this one, it, it definitely seems to have benefited Rhode Island to have CVS based here in the state. Let's talk about how fast and furious all the information is coming in, not just uh, to us. Ted, you and I have been reaching out to people one-on-one -on -one and, and a whole team of people here uh, that are getting emails through our 12 response system and we've been trying to help people navigate the bureaucracy of unemployment or understand the stimulus or small businesses that are trying to to get loans or grants uh, and, and we noticed you know even this week that there was some information that didn't line up between the Department of Labor and Training and uh, the governor's office and our inquiries to the governor about that prompted a phone call between her and Director Scott Jensen over in D at DLT and, and as we tape this we're still waiting for an answer on that but that really speaks to me anyway as to how regulators are even struggling at times with how quickly this stuff is changing and coming in. Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, especially because they're not the always the final deciders, right? Half the time or some of the time, the state is implementing laws passed by Congress that are then regulated by the U.S. Labor Department in the case of unemployment or the uh, Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid Services. So they need to find out how the feds are interpreting it before they can interpret it on the ground in Rhode Island. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, government is is trying to move, you know, at the speed of a, a, a tech startup right now, right? That, you know, standing up tests sites and rapidly rolling out new programs. You were talking with Magazine or the Treasurer uh, before about the business programs. I mean, to have banks doing an entirely new loan application program in a, a week or two is unheard of. You know, usually the banks, there are years long regulatory processes for them to go from a new program being created by Congress to actually putting money out. So, you know, I think, you know, it, it does right now remind me, we've talked about it before, of uh, right after the attack on Pearl Harbor. And you read, uh, obviously, in the history books, for people our age, but 
um, that s overnight, you know, they had to create whole new bureaucracies. They had to overhaul factories and change those over. They had to create all these new systems. They were shifting where people do their work. That's kind of happening now. The, uh, the unfortunate thing is that in World War II's case, it created a lot more jobs, whereas now we're seeing a big decrease in jobs. So that is a, a key difference between the two, the two uh, challenges History here. professor Ted Nisi over here, and I, uh, I'm proud of you for not <laughs> taking a knock at our age difference. You're getting soft on me. Hey, can we talk about <laughs> politics for a moment? Um, I don't know if you heard, but Bernie Sanders uh, dropped out. <laughs> yes, uh, you know that that might have been big news in a in a non COVID nineteen world. I know it was it ran well into the newscast the other night. That yeah. Um, another impact on politics from the pandemic, though. Um, I was interested in a story you filed. I think Thursday night you surveyed the candidates in Massachusetts fourth congressional race. That's the race to replace Congressman Joe Kennedy, who is running for U.S. Senate against Ed Markey. And you found that not every one of the candidates have been able to get their signatures yet. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting thing to watch um, in Massachusetts because Massachusetts, the signature deadline is coming up uh, early May for the federal candidates. Rhode Island signatures are June into July. But in Massachusetts, you know, obviously, social distancing, if you're following the directives from, the, from Governor Baker and down here from Governor Raimondo, you can't be out there at, at, you know, Shaw's and Stop and Shop with the clipboard asking people, take the clipboard, take the pen, you know. And when I asked the candidates, only one candidate, Jake Gockenkloss, the Newton City Councilor who we had here on Newsmakers uh, last fall, said he has already secured the 2,000 signatures required to make the ballot. Now, I, I think others will get it done. They'll find a way. I've, they're mailing ballot papers out to individual voters, asking them to mail it back so they can get them that way. They're having to try all different things, but it's a huge headache um, for those voters. And a lawsuit was just filed on Thursday, bipartisan, by some candidates, uh, including U.S. Senate candidate Kevin O'Connor, a Republican, uh, urging the Massachusetts courts to say, you have to push these deadlines off because it's not fair to candidates. It's going to keep them off the ballot. But there's not a sign yet that lawmakers on Beacon Hill are ready to to move that deadline. So this could be a real effect um, on these campaigns Why if they don't change those deadlines. Why would lawmakers do that, Ted? <laughs> well, uh, you know, not to be cynical, but some of uh, the folks I talked to in Massachusetts think that the lawmakers themselves, the incumbents, think they have enough signatures and aren't necessarily looking to help, you know, scrappy underdog uh, challengers uh, have an easier time getting it done. So uh, you hope that's not the motivation, but uh, would not be the first time in politics that self-interest helped to guide the uh, legislative agenda. So I think, I think you heard, but I got absolutely nowhere with my question to General Treasurer Seth Magaziner <laughs> when he might uh, make a decision on a run for governor in 2022. And that's, you know, really, that's one of the problems in doing journalism this way is he's not in the room and it's harder to do uh, follow-up questions, uh, you know, remotely. It's very difficult. So that was the end of that conversation. But generally speaking, when we talk <laughs> about people uh, considering a run for governor in 2022, when are you as, a pol as the politics editor going to start looking for people, you know, surrounding themselves with a team or, you know, doing the exploratory committees? When do people start making that decision? Well, I think, uh, you know, I think we got to remember a governor's race, especially in a small state like Rhode Island, is still different from a presidential race, which has now become a two year affair between the primary and the general. So, you know, 2022 is still, you know, it's not even next year, it's the year after. But as always, you know, it, there's a thing called the invisible primary, they say. Before the actual primary campaign publicly with the voters, there's the quiet moves behind the scenes to, you know, quietly line people up behind you, say, hey, are you going to be with me if I'm running? Uh, start to figure out who's going to help you with fundraising. Maybe you switch some of your staff folks around so you have people ready to shift to campaign mode. So I think, I think you know, I, I sincerely think that they all, who, you know, you had Magaziner on this week with you, Tim. You had uh, Nelly Gorbea, Secretary of State, with you last week, both of whom are expected to take a hard look at it. So, you know, I think they're all thinking about it a bit. But on the other hand, I do think this crisis has been so all-consuming that it has probably put off uh, some of the thinking around that kind of thing in electoral politics uh, for, for a lot of people, a lot of campaigns, this year's campaigns and the ones coming up. All right, Ted, we have just about a minute left. Let's pivot back to the pandemic and the economy. We are approaching 150,000 people um, who have filed for unemployment claims. That is just stunning. And, you know, it's easy to get numb to those kind of numbers, but are, yeah. it's, we're approaching almost like Great Depression numbers here. 
We are. I mean, I get, and I'm glad you brought it up, Tim, because I think exactly we're getting used to unbelievable things every day. Uh, 800 people dying a day in New York is just the new normal. And here, these unemployment numbers are absolutely staggering. I mean, you know, you hope, of course, that because so many people were out of work so fast because of the shutdown measures, you know, the, as soon as they can flip the switch, everyone's back at work. But Frankly, we know that's not going to happen. The governor has said it's going to have to be a staggered, you know, letting some people go back, some people can't go back. And that brings up big worries for both individual people and their incomes and their jobs, but also for small businesses that don't have a lot of capital. Every extra day or week of these shutdowns is, is a nightmare for these small businesses. And the longer this goes on, the more of them are going to be in deep peril, even with all the programs that are being started. So I think, I think people have to, you know, have to be braced for a tough economic situation for a while. And for a lot of people who uh, need help, Ted and I have done several videos on WPRI.com answering your questions. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We will see you next week on Newsmakers.